again, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, The Social and Political Roles of American Sewing Circles. Um, we're excited to have this program as part of Alexandra's Library Celebration of Women's History Month. Um, we have a couple other events happening throughout the system um, for the rest of the month. At the Duncan Library on March 23rd at 1.30 p.m., they'll be showing the drama Betty and Coretta about the life of Dr. Betty Shabazz and Coretta Scott King after the deaths of their husbands. And then also at Duncan on March 27th at 6 p.m., they'll be making DIY care kits, and these will be given to the City of Alexandria Domestic Violence Programs. Both of those events can be found on the Alexandria Library's event page. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Laura E. Sapelli, who is an assistant teaching professor of women's gender and sexuality studies of, and history at Penn State. Her fine art and writing explore the tensions between women's work, politics, community, and displacement. This focus emerged from her research on contributions made by American women to mass movements through their sewing circles. Currently, she is writing a book that merges quilting with STEAM education. Her publishing credits include spinning, sewing, and soliciting for the American Revolution and crafting dissent, handicraft as protest from the American Revolution to the anti-Trump pussy hats, and a post for the Textile Society of America's biannual conference, a feminist pedagogy, pedagogy through the social political stitch. Dr. Sapelli has exhibited her artwork at the Cyclorama, Boston Center for the Arts, Nash Gallery, University of Minnesota, Herdy, Herder Gallery, University of Massachusetts, and the Belger Art Center, Kansas City, Missouri. Her art is in private and public collections, including the New Bedford Free Public Library, New Bedford, Massachusetts. Dr. Sapelli, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really looking forward to what you have to share. Thank you so much, Megan. And I just wanted to ask everyone, if anyone has any hand needlework around, grab it, right? Because we can kind of mimic the circle. And if I could, I would, I'd be knitting right now, but I've got a, I have a laptop going on here with my lecture notes because I have to stay with those, otherwise I'll be going off on tangents. And my my other let my you know presentation here, so I'm like I can't do it. So please feel free to to work. Okay. Oops, let me get here. Okay. So first, let me start with the questions that I was looking at in my research. So what have been the teaching functions of family? community and enslaved people's sewing circles. So in the plantation mansion and in their homes. How have these behaviors emerged in abolition and temperance circles in these cause circles? And how have political beliefs, these women's political beliefs been expressed in their, their handmade objects? So, you know, what am, what, what are my goals for this research? It was really to discover like relationships among these home community and these political sewing circles. And how, you know, how did I collect data through uh, primary sources, autobiographies, letters, images, and archives and databases, as well as secondary sources, which are scholarly and amateur. Okay. So, you know, what are the roots of the political sewing circles? And we're going to, again, look at these more social and community circles. We're going to start with rural colonial and 19th century frontier Anglo-American sewing circles because they were so similar. Plantation mistress and enslaved people working in the mansion or house slave circles and enslaved people circles. So you can see, and this, this is a uh, an image of a um, 19th century circle in the Midwest, right? It's intergenerational. It could be extended family, neighbors, and these circles tended to share the same lifestyles, right? Same race, social class, little to no mixing of races or ethnicities. Um, women in circles tended to stay with their, with their own, like whether wealthy, middle-class, poor due to the social stigma attached to the poorer women, right? They were learning textile skills. In this case, they're actually quilting the whole quilt sandwich, right? They're, they're, they're uh, quilting through all the layers and it could be one of these, it's probably one of these women's quilts that they're doing and they're helping. 
Um, and they're also modeling acceptable female behaviors according to their class. So there's a lot going on in these circles than just making and sewing and helping. So initially settlers moved away from their immediate families, whether it was from England and then England to New England and then later from New England to the West. In these cases, women banded together to help finish domestic work and form friendships. Women had to be self-reliant before industrialization as you had to make most of your necessities, except for the wealthy who were able to purchase their goods, or they had them made by servants or enslaved people. Most of these women, you know, initial settlers lived in the middle of nowhere, far from shops or neighbors. Um, they were depend, dependent, depending on how away from the nearest shops, I always think of Little House on the Prairie and like the stories of like going for like five or 10 miles to the nearest shop. Um, so sometimes they would go once a week or once a month. And as more families settled in their areas, of course, this changed. But frontier life, whether British colonial or 19th century, was difficult for decades. So this is an excerpt from a um, journal by a poor Yankee farm girl in 1775. And you can have a look here. I'll just uh, look at the, oop, hang on a sec. Go back there. Um, Look at the amount of textile work in particular, but just overall work. Fixed gown for prude, men mother's riding hood, spun short thread, fixed two gowns for Welsh girls, carded till, spun linen, worked on cheese basket, hatched flax with Hannah. So there it could be a sister or, or, or a friend, right? They were working together. They did 51 pounds a piece, pleated and ironed. Then she threw in, she read a sermon of Doddridge's, which I'm gonna take as a minister, right? Spooled a piece, milked the cows, spun linen, did 50 knots and it goes on and on, made a broom. Um, um, but she did actually also, you can see down further on, Ellen was sparked last night. I believe that's um, in engaged. Um, went to Mr. Otis's and made them a swing and visit. So she's working like crazy doing all this you know, domestic work, but she's also you know visiting um, others and having fun, right? Um, she can read and write, of course, that's another thing. So she's living within this close-knit family and community. She's being taught not only domestic skills, but socializing with family, church members, and boys of the same class. She's a modeling acceptable and learning acceptable Yankee female behaviors and attitudes and reflecting their worldview. This situation is, was similar to women settling the frontier in the 19th century. So, this is an example of how class and race and the social stigma attached to them affected one New England woman. So this is an image of Ellen Spalding Reed. She came from a close knit, wealthy Vermont family. She married and traveled with her new husband seeking fortune in frontier Wisconsin in 1854. Unable to face the hardships of settler life, she died childless in 1858 of tuberculosis at age 22 living in a one-room shanty that resembled an enslaved, pe enslaved people's quarters, like a slave shack, Reed was far from the community and comfort of Vermont and never faced her new reality, loss of social class. Her frontier life was similar to the poor Yankee farm girls. She learned how to make soap and churn butter, but she also joined her husband in splitting rails, which is chopping logs to make fences that would border their homestead which was not typical work done by it, like a New England Yankee you know, lady, right? They didn't typically like chop rails. So in this instance, in this story, these contradictory hate behaviors emerge from Ellen. So uh, Reed's neighbors were recent immigrants from Norway who spoke no English. Recognizing their shared poverty and loneliness in a series of letters to her mother, Ellen nevertheless refused to socialize with them as she was their social better of a higher class. But wealthy local woman snubbed Reed during the only quilting bee she was invited to attend. They excluded her from future bees once they saw her poor clothes, as they were her social betters. So they were her social betters. Ellen was the Norwegian immigrant social betters. Despite her anger and loneliness of social displacement, Reed tried to deny how poverty affected her social life. She perpetuated the class and racial discrimination rampant in antebellum America. In a letter to her mother, she wrote that certain couples refused to visit her and her husband, treating them, quote, as if we were Negroes. I expect they were afraid they should get bit, end quote. 
Most of Ellen's Wisconsin middle and upper class counterparts ostracized the poor as if poverty was contagious, a feeling based on fear that they, by socializing with the Reeds, would also be suspect of poverty. This guilty by association attitude also applied to being seen with freed men and freed women. Reed was unable to recognize her contradictory attitudes and work to change them by joining abolition. Unfortunately, these attitudes prevailed for the majority of Yankee women. So this is an image of uh, Jane Bond on your left, who was um, enslaved and Rebecca Bond was the plantation mistress. So women, girls, and children worked in homes alongside the plantation mistress. In this tense sewing circle atmosphere, they learned how to weave, sew, and quilt using often complicated Anglo, tra Anglo traditions like counterpane, and how to behave, listen, and resist the domination of white owners. The quality of the slave's life often depended upon their relationships to their mistresses. Enslaved women could be punished or sold for perceived or suspected rebelliousness. Further, plantation mistresses refused to blame sexual transgressions on their husbands. Instead, they preferred to believe that enslaved women seduced them. Black women were unjustly associated with immorality, a belief in the North and the South. This unjust stigma of sexual promiscuity dogged relations between white and freed black women throughout the country before, during, and well after the Civil War in both North and South, as we will see in abolition and temperance sewing circles. So enslaved women spent their free time weaving and sewing clothes and quilts for their homes and families. Late at night, after work was done, families gathered in enslaved quarters to spend precious moments together. Some plantation owners allowed enslaved people to hold quilting parties or quiltings. On Saturday afternoons, national and local holidays, and during bad weather. The master knew that by working together, slaves could finish quilts much, much faster than alone. Collectively, they often produced three to 12 quilts per event. Quiltings also included singing and dancing when enslaved people also, also exchanged gossip and to court, as well as inform field hands of any news concerning the plantation family by using coded language. For enslaved people legally banned from learning to read and write, code talk was crucial to survival and possible freedom. Spending time together, older enslaved women taught girls how to sew, mend, and perform routine household chores and navigate and endure the difficulties ahead as enslaved women. And this is an example of an antebellum quilt made by an enslaved woman it's of course anonymous as many quilts have been made you know, throughout uh, the 19th century, they weren't signed. A descendant of enslaved people, writer Bell Hooks wrote about her grandmother, Sarah Oldham, describing the meditative healing aspect quilting gave to black women in bondage. Enslaved women experienced some freedom while piecing. Within the quilt, black women could choose, arrange, and sew designs as they pleased. And you can see here, this. It's a, um, asymmetrical and the color, so it's asymmetry in the color reflected more West African traditions where most enslaved people came from. So it's that West African aesthetic. So in conclusion, although women stitched collectively to help one another, except within the plantation house, which was more forced labor, they could only work with those of the same race and class. And again, this, was, this attitude was married in the 1850s by Ellen Spalding Reed and her attitudes. Unfortunately, Reed and others couldn't bridge the gap between her strange yet very similar Norwegian neighbors, nor could she even think about sitting next to a Negro. But by doing so, women like Reed missed opportunities to bridge class and racial hierarchies and learn that they have more in common than differences. They could have helped and learned from each other and begun the very slow social process of cutting through these class, racial, and foreign migrant hierarchies and myths. Instead, Reed and others reflected the majority who perpetuated these hierarchies in sewing circles and thought and action. 
Next, let's examine political song circles now to understand how they co-opted and resisted these social attitudes. So this is an image from the, um, the that's the board of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. And I'll refer to uh, Lucretia Mott a little later, she's right here, and Robert Purvis's wife, Harriet Purvis. And that's Robert Purvis there, and he's a freedman. So when women were banned from participating equally with men in the American Anti-Slavery Society in December of 1833, some Yankee and Southern women felt compelled to form their own abolition groups. Most women framed their work as a moral, not a political cause, to protect themselves from being accused of stepping outside the bounds of appropriate female middle-class behavior. That's the refrain of all of these, these causes, right? You can't step out of bounds. This rarely worked because abolition was so radical. It was such a radical movement. During meetings, women sewed, discussed issues and strategies, and planned entertainments and made objects for the abolition fairs, which funded the abolition cause. So the strength of the female abolition movement eventually outpaced the efforts of men. Using their needles, women raised hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, conducting anti-slavery fairs or bazaars. Often running several days, the fairs became the primary source of financing abolition campaigns. Needle cases and quilts with images like these of chained black men or embroidered with anti-slavery sayings sat alongside household items um, and clothing, including shawls, neckties, coats, cuffs, and afghans. Also included were lectures, music, singing, dancing, and drinks. And you can see that in the, in the poster here. It's an anti-slavery fair poster from Abington, Massachusetts. Women met and made the items and then organized and ran the large fairs together. Unheard of on female behavior. They were creating like these sort of sewing and sales circles for, for this really uh, passionate cause, abolition. And in the poster, they're really trying to, to draw people in with these entertainments and, but they even charge children. It's really interesting. They don't get in free. So I'm just gonna talk about um, five biracial abolition sewing circles. So let's say how Ellen Spaulding Reed's attitude did or didn't affect these circles. So you can see in Massachusetts, there were three, Salem, Boston, and Fall River. And if you don't know where Fall River is, it's near Providence, Rhode Island. And it's just like over the river from where I am, where I'm sitting right here. There was one in New York and one in Pennsylvania. So the Salem Female Anti-Slavery Society was an outlier. It was founded in 1834 by and for free black women. So, so far that I can only tell that's the only one that was founded by black women. Its efforts went beyond, far beyond abolition, however. They also supported secular and Sabbath schools for free blacks and assisted newly freed or runaway slaves. They opposed racial segregation and discrimination in the Northern free states. The society expanded its membership to include white women two years after its founding. They were seeing and acting on the big picture. The Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society was rather short-lived as some white members refused to sit next to black freed women during meetings. Nevertheless, the women's work raised thousands of dollars for the cause and their abolitionist lectures in Boston incited violent pro-slavery pro mobs. It you know, got really violent. Um, they also worked with Salem and the Fall River groups. The Ladies New York City Anti-Slavery Society, they were, uh, they were a little sly. They excluded white working class and freed black women by requiring an expensive membership fee to join. So despite their prejudice, they claimed sisterhood with enslaved women. So they, they, they were a bit more like got around it with the membership fee. They refused to cross the color line. It was still that abstract moral crusade. So in Fall River in 1835, Quaker Elizabeth Buffum Chase and her sisters founded the Fall River Female Anti-Slavery Society. After three black women attended the meetings, 
and applied to join the Fall River Anti-Slavery Sewing Society. So that was the first group. It was the Fall River Anti uh, Fall River Sewing Society um, as official members. Some of the white members opposed their inclusion. So Chase described the opposition as preoccupied with custom and decorum. Again, you know, this is this idea of proper female behavior and who, who you're going to be associated with. Quote. They were willing to help and encourage them, the, the Black freed women, in every way, but they did not think it was at all proper to invite them to join the society. Chase and her sisters were interested in ending all racist practices, even outside of slavery. Chase worked with the Boston group, participated in their abolition fairs, and held their own fairs. So the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society formed in 1833. Membership included wealthy black and middle-class white women. Um, freed woman Charlotte Fortin, who you see here on your left, and she was, she was the uh, wife of Robert Purvis in the other image. Her daughter, Sa oh no, this is Harriet, I'm sorry. So Charlotte Fortin, her daughter, Sarah and Margarita and Harriet Fortin Purvis, she is pictured here, um, joined Quakers Lucretia Mott, who's here on your right, Sarah Pugh, and recent Quaker converts, Sarah and Angelina Grimke. Some, but not all white members boycotted goods produced with slave labor, including cotton, fruits, vegetables, which was an effort initiated by the black members. Funds generated by their abolition fairs and donations supported the Pennsylvania Abolition Society and the Underground Railroad to house, protect, and transport escaped slaves. Their racially desegregated gender mixed meetings and female public speakers generated hatred among Philadelphians. I mean, this was unheard of behavior. Since they had difficulties renting space to hold events because of this, they raised enough money to build Pennsylvania Hall, which is pictured here, which opened May 14th, 1838. While the American Convention of Anti-Slavery Women met inside its doors, a mob surrounded the hall, shouting abuse and throwing stones through the windows. Membership refused to end the biracial proceedings. On the evening of May 17th, three days later, however, the outraged mob set fire to and destroyed the hall. The Philadelphia police and firefighters ignored the scene. Undaunted, the women met in a schoolhouse of member Sarah Pugh. Soon after they formed, however, unfortunately, most of the white members refused to acknowledge black leadership and their demands for immediate emancipation of Pennsylvania enslaved people and educational quality for black children in the Pennsylvania schools. Even Quaker members couldn't see these educated black women as fit for freeing themselves as architects of black freedom beyond abolition. Most white mem members saw them as objects to be reformed, embodying the sins of slavery, which is the mixing of white and black blood. The group represented a fleeting moment of true biracial unity. So in conclusion, despite raising thousands of dollars and wholeheartedly supporting abolition as a passionate cause, each abolition group attempting to work biracially had mixed results. White women failed to understand that black women were autonomous and intelligent human beings equal to them and knew better than white people what abolition needed to accomplish to liberate, support and protect freed and soon to be emancipated men and women. White members refused to see black freed people as equals Instead, Anglos perpetuated the beliefs that they were Black people's social and political betters, as Ellen Spalding Reed described it, and refused to support the broad platforms necessary for post-emancipation post society in the United States. So now we go to temperance. So temperance initi initiatives began during the ratification of the Constitution in 1787. Alcohol and distilled spirits were cheap and readily available. Women sought advice from clergy on how to deal with their drunken husband's abuse. And this image is as, as contemporary as any, right? So the issue of linking drinking to domestic violence and a family's financial ruin resurged after the Civil War. As former soldiers suffering phys physical and psychic wounds, wounds from the war experiences were susceptible to the bottle as a cheap and easy way to deal with their trauma like PTSD. Alcoholism devastated families across class and race. So in 
So this is an image of Mother Thompson. So Eliza Jane Trimble Thompson of Hillsborough, Ohio was an initial driving force of temperance. Thompson lost a son to alcoholism. Inspired by a temperance lecture in December of 1873, she began leading women's groups into saloons where they sang hymns and prayed for the closure of these establishments. And the quilt on the right was made much later in 1876 um, in honor of Mother Thompson and the cause. So these direct nonviolent, like these prayers, these visitation bands were the roots of the massive efforts of women for temperance. You can see them, the women here praying and kneeling in front of a saloon. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, was formed in 1874 to help organize fundraising campaigns to support its leaders' publications and lecture tours. Temperance initiatives swept the country, becoming one of the largest 19th century women's reform movements. Their platform, it was pretty broad actually. It also included the eight-hour workday, child care for working women, vocational training for women, prison reform and suffrage. A worldwide effort to curb liquor and drug traffic led to the massive, massive polyglot petition, which as you can see here, that's like rolls of signatures, where members from 50 countries collected over 7 million signatures in its support, 7 million. It was exhibited, exhibited at the Chicago World's Columbian Exposition in 1893 and later presented to President Cleveland in Congress. This was a global movement temperance. It wasn't just in the United States. So this is uh, Frances Willard. And what's really important to remember at temperance was women officially ran and operated the WCTU. It wasn't like men and women were under it. This was a strictly a female led cause and, and organization. So in 1879, the board of directors elected the single-minded Yankee, Frances Willard, pictured here as the organization's president. From her election until her death in 1898, membership soared. Members were an eclectic mix of Northeast, Midwest, and Southern chapters that drew white Protestant, middle-class and working class, as well as African-American women. Like the female abolitionists, temperance members were willing to risk public and private outrage by straying from their domestic sphere in the name of social reform. Women felt more comfortable in this movement since it embraced traditional female values and piety while challenging such behaviors in their crusades, right? They were, they were doing public speaking, which was unladylike. Willard used, Willard deployed members' organizational and needlework skills learned from conducting their church bazaar, bazaars and charity fairs. Local chapters placed booths at every exposition, state or county fair. Specifically, they sold the 10 cent signature quote, popular in female fundraising efforts. Temperance members politicized hand towels, like you see here, and banners, among other items, by embroidering them with temperance slogans. Although it is unclear when the quilt pattern snake in the grass became drunkard's bat, temperance adopted it as a political symbol by the end of the 19th century. Willard supported African-American members to lead temperance efforts among their people, but chapters were segregated, there were no official biracial groups as an abolition. Although appointing black freedwoman and well-known poet, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who is pictured here, a superintendent of its department of work among colored people, Willard and most temperance members drew clear racial boundaries. Black women were instrumental to the cause, but their efforts were sidelined. In a presidential address given during the organization's national conference held in Cleveland in 1894, Willard accepted the South socially and legally encoded color line. She wanted support from Southern white women for the cause and she was willing to cross that line. In conclusion, WCTU members raised hundreds of thousands of, do of dollars, formed a global coalition against drugs while also supporting many issues current today, childcare for working women and prison reform. Yet their political sewing circles and efforts remained segregated as did most of the abolition sewing circles. 
Willard could not transcend race and work toward unity in the temperance cause, couldn't ha have it an integrated cause. Now, I, I could not uh, end this uh, presentation without referring to the uh, library's namesake. So this is Dr. Kate Waller Barrett. Uh, she is also associated with helping women. So soon after marrying Reverend, Reverend Barrett, uh, Dr. Barrett moved with, moved with him to a slum district in Richmond. They lived in an area of saloons, cheap resorts, and dilapidated dwellings. But Dr. Barrett was driven to help, especially unwed mothers, and to educate people that prostitution was not a necessary evil. Facing and overcoming incredible challenges throughout her life, including losing her 45-year-old husband, Barrett supported six children while holding offices in many organizations and served, served on numerous boards and commissions. And guess what? She was involved in the WCTU. We couldn't find anything else more on that, but I thought that was really important to tie her in. So in conclusion, despite the challenges of race and, cla race and class borders and temperance and abolition groups, women across class and race lines single-handedly helped achieve abolition and temperance, essential to ratifying the Constitution's 13th and 18th Amendments. Without the vote and with little, little to no access to education and professions, especially that of politicians, women proved a force to be reckoned with in the sweeping political movements of the 19th century. Central to these efforts were the objects they created and sold through their sewing circles and their organization skills learned from church and charity fairs, which were adopted and expanded to political affairs that supported these causes. Black and white women's roles in these massive political movements continue to be underrepresented and underappreciated in contemporary history texts. I teach at Penn State and I'm a, I have a joint appointment and you know, they're sort of the, the pop-up window of the book, of the textbook, they're still like the sidebar. But one lesson is certain. Activists must work together across gender, class, and race to achieve that ideal of social and political equality. We must overcome myths and stereotypes to unite against all oppressions, a world free of human traffic and drug abuse, sexism, racism, classism. So I have a whole list of references and I'm happy to send the slide presentation to Megan if anyone you know, wants to look at it. And of course, she's a font of information. Take full advantage of your research librarians. So I want to thank you so much for your interest in, in and also listening to this lecture, which you know is just not part of US history. It's part of world history and women's history. So thank you so much. And I'll take any questions. Dr. Cipelli, thank you so much. Um, yes, if you have questions um, that you'd like to ask, um, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, I guess while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, how did you get, get interested in learning this history? What, what drew you to learning about sewing circles? You know, I think it started with, um, I was at UMass Dartmouth getting my teaching license and I uh, was on a way to a master's in art ed. And I, you know, I, I've been involved since a kid in circles and it just somehow evolved that I started, I was teaching a textiles in the K through 12 classroom and we started doing these small little stitch drawing quilts. And I was like, wow, you know, and we were literally just a big circle of like, you know, there were men, women, there were, you know, different ages and we were all sewing together and talking and sewing. And so they, you know, it, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then I just kind of went from there, Megan. I kind of, you know, when I got to Penn State, it was kind of in the back of my mind and, and then I started just, you know, doing the research. I'm like, wow, this is really amazing. I had never heard of abolition sewing circles or temperance sewing circles. You know, again, I had a little, I knew a bit about Ida B. Wells and Francis Willard from other courses a few years back. But, and so, you know, I was encouraged like, hey, you know, my advisor, like, you know, let's, you know, do it. So my dissertation was just not about like the, the historical circles. I also held um, circles on the Penn State campus and, I started out with faculty and students and then I ended up like I met this one woman who was referred to by a student and she was in the Penn State, uh, uh, you know, out, out, you know, just a, a person out in Penn State, outside of Penn State. And next thing you know, like I met all these other women and it was just it was amazing. And, you know, just getting to know and, and, and talking and 
you know, they were going through some issues at that time. And, you know, it's the life cycle. And then sometimes graduate students and undergrads would join us. Like, it was great. And, and so that, I just kind of like that, I think that initial circle in that particular art education class suddenly spurred me on to, you know, a few years later doing the dissertation. And there's still so much to be done. I mean, this is just like that much. I'm glad that you started on this path. Um, oh, and then there's a couple questions that have come in. Um, I'm interested in sewing circles of World War II and just after. Um, is there any info about that or later times? There must be. And you know, it's it's interesting. Like I didn't look at that, but uh, what's the name of the book? I think it's called Knitting for Peace. And a lot of those circles, like, right, they were about knitting for, for the soldiers. Um, and even World War I, um, so you had, I think you had World War I veterans who were knitting in World War II. And there's images of that. But go to Megan, you know, start, <laughs> do some Google searches, but then, you know, or go to your, your librarians. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. Again, I kind of stopped at 19th century. Like, I didn't even go to suffrage. Um, because suffrage, our suffrage movements wasn't like the English suffrage movement that really used sewing. Um, we, Katie Stanton and, and, and Anthony were like, no, it's too oppressive, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, but yeah, they, there there are there is information out there. And again, what's great is you get that the the men's circles, you know, the men helping the soldiers and helping the cause. That does sound interesting. Yes, it, we can we can look that up if you yeah. are interested. Um, although I will say um, we just had a, a talk a couple of weeks ago about um, the Aquacon suffrage um, prisoners who were protesting um, for suffrage in this area, and they they did do make some quilting or um, um, signs that were all handmade that they used in part of their their protest. So there was a little bit of it. So it was thought yeah, it was a great absolutely. Time. And you know, it's just I guess it, it wasn't as in the forefront, but. Absolutely. You know, it's just that you, you, you hear more about it with the, the pan curse, you know, and like, for example, like Frances Willard in Temperance, she, she didn't sew, she hated that stuff, but she knew she used it as a political weapon, right? And she knew those women loved it and she wanted to put it to that political use, right? And it united them. So I, I, I mean, personally, I think it was kind of a mistake of Katie, um, of Elizabeth Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, they could have turned that more political, but that's great, right? Like stories like that have to come out. But I, like as an overall picture, the leaders were just like, you know. Um, there's another question that came in. Um, can you tell us about the inspiration for your book, um, the title Crafting Descent? So that's not my book. It's an edited collection. I did a, um, I did an essay on it. So, um, uh, God, I can't think of her name, but the editor, she she um, writes she writes about scandals and stuff, and she is a um, I think she's a knitter, and you know she I think she was part of the whole pussy hat thing, and she just decided to put it all together, right? So that's a bit more scholarly, but it's it's a pretty if you get it from the library, get it from the library and check it out. Um, so yeah, I can't take credit for that. Like that that was. I took a piece of my one of my chapters on American um, sewing circles and their role in the revolution, you know. So uh, yeah, yeah. That, but, that but you are was the was the pussy hats. Okay, but, but you are writing a book. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the book you're working on? Sure. So that book's very different. Um, I'm a, a, an assistant teaching professor, so I'm not on the tenure track, so I have a lot more freedom with what I want to write and you know doing presentations like this. Um, so. I, not only do I have a women's studies background and a history background, I also have an art education K through 12 background. I have a, a, a teaching license to teach that. And when I was teaching five years in Chicago, I was at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, helping to run their teacher prep program. And, you know, I was really disappointed with how art ed is right now. It's just, I just feel it really needs to be broadened with a lot more like you know, craft media. I mean, you know, Van Gogh and all those guys, Picasso are great, but it's just, it's so big, right? So, you know, especially with quilting and embroidery. So that book, it's called Quiltometry. And what I'm doing is teaching geometry, basic geometry through the quilt, because it's an ideal art form to use. Like you have, I don't know if any of you quilt, but um, Barbara Brackman, who's very well known in the field, She's uh, written a book called The Encyclopedia of Quilt Patterns. And, you know, she said she almost failed geometry and she does tessellated quilts, like these incredibly, like all these little triangles and, and it, it's just, 
you know, it just makes me crazy. And when I took geometry, you know, it was just, it was just too abstract. I just needed something to look at, to hold, to relate to. So what I'm doing, and, and it's STEAM, so it's like science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So I'm not only using the quilt form to teach, you know, like a right angle, but also including stories about women. So this, I'm sliding in women's history, right? I'm sliding in art, like composition. And to me, it just, it, it just comes naturally, you know? So it's not just, it's kind of like art, history, math, you know, really just trying to link it, you know, interdisciplinary um, together. And, you know, as an enrichment piece, or maybe homeschoolers, you know, like someone can pull it in and, and, and put it in their curricula. So yeah, I just need that, you know, that that holding something, right? Make it real. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And you're right, there's so many different ways that people learn and to to incorporate all those together is such a holistic way of, of bringing an experience. So that sounds very, very interesting. Thanks. <laughs> Um, there's been a couple comments um, that I'll share. Um, oh, someone said this This has made me very curious about the political activism of similar groups later in the 1900s, perhaps in support or in protest of war efforts and other social issues. Mm. And then um, someone shared that right now the National Museum of Women in the Arts has an exhibit on women crafts um, and recognizing them as art. So That's in DC, yeah, I gotta get down there. I'm still in central Pennsylvania not right now. And it's funny, my roommate, um, her partner's in Alexander, Virginia area, actually. So, I, you know, she's always like, yeah, you got to come down. I may have to take her up on it or just like get in my car and get down there. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And, and I encourage you all. And I have to tell you, I, I, you know, I was really writing in 2015. There is, um, I mean, there's a bazillion more, so much more digitized. Like that, some of those images I picked up, like Elizabeth Buffum Chase, Everyone, I'm going to tell you, I went to Chase Street School. Okay, that's part of the Chase family, like here in Somerset. No idea. I had no idea. And there's a Fall River Historical Society. And at the time, back in 2015, almost 10 years ago, I was calling them and nothing. So here I am. I'm like, let me just do a Google search. Boom. Right? So in that nine years, it's just incredible how much has come up. And you know, you got to make sure you vet it, make sure it's you know real. But yeah, it's really exciting. So please like go out there and do the research. <laughs> do it and share it. If you have a blog or someone, you know, like share it, share it. That's wonderful. We didn't get too much into your presentation, but you mentioned that you had started a, a sewing circle when you were started teaching. Um, how, I'm wondering, um, as you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that a lot of this um, work was done out of necessity that people, you, you couldn't go to the store to purchase any of these items. Why do you think that people continue to do these things that we, we could, would be so much easier to just go and buy them? Um, why do you think it continues sewing circles specifically to be um, a part of our culture? You know, because so many of us are just doing like this now. <laughs> And, and even a Zoom circle works. Like I was doing a lot of that um, during the pandemic, but there is just something about, and also there's something about making stuff with your hands. Like here, this is an image. Uh, this was at the Art Institute. I did some, um, we would do some quilting before the class started. Humble power, you know, just an image. I just love that image. And there's something about, it just calms people down. I found students would come to class to be really nervous, calm them down, let them talk, let just small talk. Like small talk's important, right? And I have to say at Penn State, I taught a couple of intro history courses in residence. And I, I, I took the first 50 minutes of the class. I brought my cart. I put all the quilting stuff out and, and, and I let all the students quilt and just talk. Because we were talking about things like this, like race and class and pretty uncomfortable stuff for a lot of them. And what that did, it established relationships, even if it was acquaintances. So I found... Like students had to, you know, they went on the online um, platform and they would, you know, put their posts up so they had something to talk about. But they were much more comfortable with each other talking about some of this stuff and sharing their stories. It really helped. I mean, you know, not everyone loved it, but I have to say probably 90% of the students were like, you know, this was okay. This was pretty cool. And 
a lot, most of my students were not in art majors. Maybe there might've been one art history majors, but they were like supply chain or business, right? <laughs> like supply chain, I love it. So they were just like, oh, wow. And for the final projects, I encouraged artistic approaches. So one student, she made a movie of her friend who's in New York, a dancer trying to get dance gigs. And she's a bigger girl. And she was having very difficulties because of her her look, right? Her physique. She wasn't the skinny ballerina type. And she had a film about it and she said it to music and she said, I've never done this. And it was great, right? You know, or other people wanted to make quilts with their grandmothers. And I don't know, like that to me has a lot more content, emotion. Students are really going to connect. They're going to learn so much more than just like writing another essay, you know? So I was really lucky. My department chair was she said, no, I really like what you're doing with these classes. I was really happy because, you know, not, not every university would let me have done that. Um, so it builds community. You get to know people, it builds trust, um, friendship. And, you know, it's not always great. Like this is one of my Penn State circles. And, you know, I felt displaced at points because I'm not married. I don't have kids. Right. And they were at a lifestyle point where some of their kids were either in college or some were grandmothers. And I was out of that conversation. Right. And it's, it's okay, but you know, it's just, you know, there are these times that, you know, you you feel like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't relate. I can just knit and that's okay. Right. So, but I still like, I love them. And we, we just, we just had a great time. And this is actually at a cafe in Lamont. It's great cafe. And you know, we'd sit and have coffee and take over. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. No, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And that's so fascinating. I definitely would have appreciated taking a class where I got to knit or quilt um, while we were in class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like radical, right? Radical. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? All right. Well, uh, Dr. Cepelli, this has been so great. I, um, I, I see lots of comments in the in the chat that people really um, found this very fascinating and um, learned new things. So thank you so much for sharing um, what you've researched with us, um, uh, and especially during Women's History Month. It's really amazing to see how um, women's work can be incorporated into the, the fabric of American history. So um, thank you for that. Oh, you're so welcome. And it's also so, it's just, um... It's also, it, it just, how can I say it? It helps, it helps you personally as well. I think, you know, you can, sometimes like it's so everything, like you, you're online, you're doing this and you just want to knit, you know? <laughs> and it's also great because you can knit and hang out with people. You know, I don't knit, I can't, like some of these women were doing these crazy like Argyles and all this. I can't do that. Like that's way too difficult for me to, to kind of interact with people and do that kind of complex kind of work. But it's just so nice to, you know, to just get out or sit with my family and just knit and, yeah, it's it's just great. Or if you want to make it for yourself or donate it, I don't know. I, it's just it's just a great it's just a great thing. It's really fulfilling. Absolutely is. Yeah, yeah. And I think we had definitely a lot of crafters on on the call this evening too. So. Hey, there we go. Yeah, this Patty. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go, Coral. Woo! <laughs> good, good. And it's okay, those of you that don't, that's right, maybe you'll take it up. You know, maybe you may have to have some sort of like craft hour at the library, you know? Oh, we definitely, we have, each branch has at least one um, quilting or sewing oh. or um, knitting group. So yes, we have lots of them as well. Good. Oh, good, 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 good. Oh, well, I, again, if there's no more questions or, you know, oh, there's somebody else, look, there's Marianne. Yeah, oh, the weaver. Woo! There's the weaver. Love it, love it. Oh yeah, this is great. This is awesome. Yeah, keep keep it up, you know? All right, everyone. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.